All right. Um, welcome, everyone. Thank you for um, joining us for the second event of the first project series this year, organized by the American Institute of Architects Hong Kong chapter. So while we are, you know, waiting for our audience to trickle into our Zoom webinar room, I would like to first thank um, Florence Chan, our president of AIA Hong Kong 2022, for supporting us in organizing this event tonight. We are also very delighted to have um, Clover Lee, founder and director of Plus Clover, as the moderator for tonight's event. And I would like to invite Clover to give an introduction to our speakers tonight. Clover. Thanks, Chang. Um, I am really honored to be able to introduce our speakers tonight, um, Ron Whitty and Sarah Whiting. Um, they are the founders and principals of WW Architecture. Both of them also have side hustles. Um, Sarah is the Dean of Harvard Graduate School of Design, where Ron is the professor in residence of architecture. Now, when Florence invited me to introduce these folks, uh, Sarah, Florence knew full well that I would take this opportunity to talk about myself. Um, <laughs> I met Ron and Sarah um, when I was a graduate student at the GSD. Um, and this was during Ron and Sarah's kind of first round at the GSD, the 1.0 version. Um, since then, they have been at, Harvard, uh, been at Princeton, at Rice, where Sarah was dean, and then um, now back at the GSD for the 2.0 version. So it was during the 1.0 version that uh, I took a seminar with Sarah called Formalism. It's also where I met Florence. Um, and I also did a research project with Ron on Aerogel, which culminated in the Ultra Material in Material exhibit. Um, I also had a chance to work at WW uh, the first summer after I finished at the GSD, where um, I was redoing some drawings for their website and for these brochures. And I think that was my first interaction really with IntraCenter. Um, and since then, uh, I had the privilege to work with them on two other occasions um, for the San Jose University Museum of Art and Design and also um, the Toronto Waterfront competition. They were both competitions. Um, they were short, but really intense times where I got to see how their work on the figure that started from the intra center, which I believe they're gonna talk about tonight, um, developed in the subsequent um, competition projects. And where I learned you know, how they see the relationship between figure and program that it's not a one-to-one -one relationship, and also how they solicit compound readings of the figure. Um, I remember really well that Ron told me that you should not define something by what it is not. Um, but I'm gonna break that rule tonight. I'm gonna tell you that tonight is definitely not about me. So with that, I will <laughs> mute and let Ron and Sarah tell us about their first project. Thank you, Ron, Sarah. Uh, thank you all, um, Chang, Clover, and also Florence. Um, and, and Clover, I, did you actually hand in your last assignment for that seminar? I, what? I wonder if you still <laughs> owe me some work. So let's, um, let's figure that no, one no, out. No, 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 <laughs> no. We are, we are delighted to be here and uh, very honored to have the um, AIA Hong Kong um, Turn to us to hear about our first project. This is um, this this has been a, a really interesting talk to uh, prepare. We don't often talk together, so this is not a rehearsed, smooth um, show for you. Uh, but we are really looking forward to uh, presenting <clears throat> today, this morning for us, and and um, evening for you. So. Um, let's let's go ahead and get started. We'll jump in. Uh, maybe just to clarify, we do actually talk to each other. It's only we sometimes talk in lectures together, but we generally talk to each other over dinner or breakfast and things like that. Um, okay, I'm going to share our screen and just jump in. Can you guys see the screen there? Yes. 
Okay. Okay. Um, all right, great. Um, as Sarah said, thank you very much for including us in your series. It's really an honor to be here. And uh, thank you, Florence, Chang, and Clover for hosting us. It's, it's really great to see all of you and it means a lot to us. Um, in the interest of just jumping in, we're gonna talk about, uh, to begin with, a project called the Intra Center. And it is, as Clover alluded to, it was a pretty important project for us in a lot of ways. And maybe just to give you a sense of how important um, this project was done essentially 25 years ago at this point, it was, it was started about 25 years ago. And about five years ago, we actually returned to it and did some additional thinking about it and drawing on it um, just to sort of see what we could glean from that particular moment in our, in our history. So as Sarah pointed out, preparing for this talk was really interesting for us because it gave us another chance to review that and see this project and a couple of others, but this project in particular in relation to later work. Yeah, I think that's a good test of a first project is um, returning to it, reviewing it, and in our case, redrawing it. Yeah, with, um, yeah. Which yeah. I think made a difference. So what, what's important maybe about this project is the way it came to us was through a nonprofit organization, two women who, one was a principal of an elementary school and the other one uh, was running a nonprofit. They partnered to produce an organization that wanted to build this building. And they came to us with an extraordinarily rich program, um, rich meaning yeah. almost out of control, crazy, like a crazy quilt of anything that you could imagine would go into this, did go into it. Social services, educational, financial support kinds of services, um, uh, endless list of, of program types. And what was striking to us was not so long before this, we had both worked at OMA and we were sort of in, uh, entrenched in certain ways of thinking about program and inventing program. And it all of a sudden dawned on us, on us that it was very clear these two women were way ahead of us when it came to what at that time was often referred to as programmatic hybridity. So we wanted to think about that. And really what we started to do was think about what do we do when the client side of the conversation essentially overwhelms what we, what we thought was our directive, conceptual directive as architects. And this, this allowed us to reintroduce notions of, of form. I think another important thing to mention about this project is it's located in Lexington, Kentucky, which is famous for its horse farms. It's also where the University of Kentucky is located. But it was for a neighborhood that had a significant number of about what three quarters of the population living under the poverty line. Yeah. And so this was partly the programmatic hybridity and exuberance came out of a desire to provide a resource for a population that was under-resourced. And I think this issue of who you're doing this for um, becomes important and we'll, we'll come back to that point. Yeah, so this, this is meant to just give you a kind of preview. This is what the plan on the upper level, there are four levels in the building, looks like as we go into explaining it, just to give you some uh, kind of visual registration as we get going. What, what was interesting to us, uh, maybe first and foremost in the project, was the idea that program and form are clearly linked to one another. Um, we, we think that form is actually the primary tool that we have as architects. Uh, we can sort of uh, imply things about program with it. But in this case, what we were interested in is the way in which program and form are not necessarily matched. They're not concentric, if you want to look at them that way. So in fact, it was this diagram that we were starting to aim at versus say a functionalist diagram on the left that looks like that. Now, the, the, the technique that we started to look at had to do with partial figures really and how they might combine with one another. And the analogy one might use is the way that parentheses work in a sentence. So for example, the way in which a certain subset idea might be called out in a given text. Um, and this was, this was uh, a, a something that became very important to us with a couple of adaptations, uh, namely, as anybody who's ever taken third grade English knows, you always have to start with a, a parenthesis and end with a parenthesis. And we decided that we would like to start with a parenthesis, but allow the other one to exist in all kinds of other places in the text. So we could, we could begin to uh, have many more permutations and combinations of spatial relationship by doing that. And I think what's important there too is understanding that something that comes from another field can inspire you, 
but is um, completely translated and relevant to our field. So we saw this as um, these nesting of relationships that um, exists in language, but we, we understood it purely uh, through architecture. So in that same plan that we showed a moment ago, these red lines now are the parentheses that we're referring to or the forms. And one could imagine that in a normal circumstance, this might become a kind of programmatic zone of relationship. But in the way that we were trying to use these, this parenthesis might combine, for example, with this one or this one, or for that matter, this one. This is a big plenum space that goes all the way down to the basement level of the building. So we could combine and recombine zones of, of program using these parentheses, these formal devices, walls and structural systems, um, basically to produce new kinds of unexpected, uh, quite dynamic relationships. And it's suggesting relationships. So this is just simply a plan of the permutations and combinations that come out of all of those parentheses. And this is by no means an exhaustive list. You can imagine that the, that number of combinations amplifies very quickly. Here's the ultimate series of plans going from, from the lower level here to the to plus three here. This is the ground level. You can also see in these plans a, a, a desire to not limit the organization that we were using to simply the interior, the interior being this area here, but also to extend out into the landscape in various ways, into a site, into a, an outdoor space behind the building. And this has ramifications in, uh, we, we you know, maybe to back up a moment, we have a predilection for plans. Uh, we happen to like plans a lot. I teach a seminar on plans. Uh, this is a subject that's really important to me, but of course there are implications for sections as well in terms of how daylight, air, structural systems would be usable to enable the kinds of re relationships that we're talking about in plan to take on a sectional life. And we were very interested in how a structural system would lace through this. What would happen as a structural system in a fairly uh, typical post and beam kind of organization would, would fan out and become a kind of lighter weight system at various points as it crossed over the, the overall system of parentheses in the building. So there's, there's a kind of migration of structural types um, going along the length of the building that way. I think it's important to point out though that the structure is um, subordinate to the idea of how the form is affecting program. And I think that the, um, it's, it's less a question of making, you know, sort of hitting someone on the head with these ideas than suggesting relationships and creating a formal situation that allows you to read the architecture in different ways. Yeah, that's a very important point. You won't generally see us showing off structural hardware, so to speak, in, in our work. This is a, a very simple little diagram that shows, in a sense, what we were interested in, in terms of these figures coming in and out of relevance in the plan, kind of we're, percolating. Yeah, we're showing your age because I'm not sure anyone knows what a percolator is. I, I've never seen one in real life, but you claim you have. You get the idea. These figures come in and out of presence as you make your way around the building. One of the other things just in passing we wanted to point out is the way in which this work uh, is certainly design work. We are a, a practice that's designing buildings and we're, we continue to do that. But we also very quickly translate that work often into writing, into thinking about um, our work and subjects in architecture in, in our field, our collective field, all of us, uh, through the lens of text. I, I think we should point out, so we, the intra center we see as a first project, it's really where our um, idea of practice came together and remains a very foundational project. So this series is really, I think, um, pertinent to us. We're going to show you a couple more projects. We're not showing projects exhaustively. We're really touching on this idea of the relationship of form and program through a series of projects so that you see how this first project plays out in different projects in our work mm -hmm. and remains a consistent project for us, let's yeah, say, yeah, architectural yeah. ambition. Um, to that end, the next, the next project that we're going to show is something called the L House. L stands, stands for um, Escobar Lavenda, and they are the clients for this house in Houston, Texas. 
this was a house that we built uh, about uh, six, five, six years ago and a single family residence. The, what, what was important in the house was, um, as in most American suburbs, they are increasing in intensity, meaning that lots are being filled out in ways that presses against side yards. So we were, we were very interested in the, in the uh, particular problem of relationships becoming internalized in a house, that one doesn't crane outward, so to speak, because as soon as you crane outward, look through a window, you immediately see a neighbor's wall. So relationships in the house are all constructed internal to, to the, the life of its residents. And we really started therefore with a series of voids. Uh, we basically built the house out of negative spaces being collected. So a courtyard in the middle, uh, a few uh, cuts on the sides of the house, a slot for an entry, a terrace in the back, and basically around that, a plan emerges. Um, so the house in a way could be understood as, as really being designed as a set of voids, not a set of solids. And I think importantly, that central void, it's a, it's a courtyard house and sort of understanding the courtyard typology. But what happens when you look at a courtyard house that has a circular courtyard as opposed to a rectilinear one, which is more typical? This is the ground floor plan. It's a two level house. Here's a little diagram that basically shows those, shows those parts coming together. And if the parentheses in the interest center nest in terms of their parenthetical relationships, here you have these voids sort of nesting together and locking in the form of the building, which you see here. Here's a, a, just a set of rotated isometrics showing those different voids. And this is really the, the sort of summary of what that produces, a series of what we call wobbly axes that are view corridors through windows, uh, very often from one space in the house to an outdoor space to back to the house, inside the house, um, not necessarily avoiding views outside, but essentially a series of skewers that tie together spaces in the house through these axes. Um, there are a number of things in here. You'll see sort of a, an attitude toward alignment in this case, but an, al an alignment which may not be predicated on the certainties of, say, center lines, but simply uh, on the edges of windows and the way in which one oscillates in space. And in fact, the way as you move your head, perspective changes. Yeah, I think what's super interesting here is, again, you see the play of the circular courtyard creating different views, but also these placement of these voids creating, I, I think this term wobbly axis that Ron uses is super important in terms of taking a, uh, again, a traditional approach to um, views that are at an axis that are fixed in, in architecture, changing that slightly, but not turning it into craziness. Here's what those, those plans eventually look like with a little less distraction from the red lines. Lower level here, second level here. You can also see something happening here where there's a kind of a cut that goes in from the, on the ground level here and another cut that goes in here. And those stack up to produce a kind of a reversed U. Um, uh, uh, I visited the house once with a group of students while we were still in Houston okay. and somebody made a really interesting characterization of this terrace being a back front porch, which is true actually, as you, as you walk in here, you see from here down through like this. It was a very nice, uh, I can't take credit for it, uh, but it was a very nice characterization of how that section worked. And here's a few views of those wobbly axis kind of relationships where you see, for example, from inside a space, outside onto another, another interior space and eventually onto an exterior space. Same kind of thing here, same kind of thing here, 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 et cetera. That's the front porch, that's, back, that's back, that, back, the, back porch, the back front, front porch. porch. Yeah. So here's the entry down below and, and you're toward the back of the house looking back on the upper terrace. This is a view from the front, looking back up to that terrace again here from outside on the street side. And going back to Ron's uh, opening point, I think that the, the idea that this is in a very dense and um, uh, neighborhood, that you have the possibility of stealing space from specific views without it being precious or singular. So all of these views multiply through the house. Um, but we all know that as architects, that stealing space through views is part of what we do.
The next project that we're going to talk about is uh, quite related to the L House. Mm. They were happening almost coincidentally in terms of time. Um, this is a bigger project, um, and it comes with a very interesting story in terms of uh, the clients. Uh, the project is located in a little town called Kaiwei in China, and um, the client came to us not really knowing exactly what she wanted to put into it, so we invested a lot of time in trying to figure out how the program would work and how the building and that program might be related, as you can imagine from other things you heard already from us. But I'm gonna take you through a really rapid story now about exactly how this unfolded. And uh, the real point is, how does program get undone in architecture? Um, remember, we, we are sort of uh, dyed in the wool program uh, aficionados uh, having come out of OMA in the, in the early 90s. And think of how this real story relates to the Inter Center. Yeah, so we were given a really great site with no program. Uh, we worked on that design for six months, basically as a way of going back and forth with the, the client to say, you know, what would you like in the building? Um, we eventually came up with a program. Everybody was happy. Then the site moved. It was still really beautiful. We, everybody was even happier. And then the site moved again. The new site was extraordinary. Great program, great site. We were, everybody was in heaven about the whole thing. And then the site moved again, and it was incredibly ugly. The site was terrible. We, we had no interest at all in the site. It was super, super ugly site. And on top of that, the client came back to us and said, you know, I don't really know what I want to have happen in this building. So we had an ugly site and they had no idea what to put in it. And of course, we were sad. And, and we had no idea exactly what we would do with our roles as architects at that moment. You know, there are two things that we had learned. One is program is really important and we can get our heads around that and we can react to it. The other is if you can't find anything good in the program, then you can always turn to site and make something out of that. Um, we had no idea at this point. And yet this was there. She still wanted us to design a building for this circumstance. This was incredibly paralyzing for about three days. Um, imagine how many boxes of Kleenex we went through for three days. <laughs> so, uh, and at the end of that, it became incredibly exciting because we started to rethink the way in which we had been thinking about program with such confidence in its own terms. And we began to think about things that are well known to probably many of you, namely uh, the notion of, of universal space that a figure like Mies would have, would have uh, trafficked in. And we started to think of it not so much as universal space, but space that required a little bit more catalyst, a little bit more form, a little bit more definition to prompt certain kinds of programmatic possibilities without necessarily saying, this is the name of that room, or this is the kind of function uh, in a one-to-one -one say that that room would produce. This is really the setup for this project. And so the idea was to, we'll come back around to these slots, but the idea was really to cut a series of slots into the building like this. These are outdoor spaces. And those would then shape a series of relations around them and through them that would be uh, variable and incite a kind of program as opposed to uh, absolutely defining or absolutely taking your hands off of the definition of program. So a kind of, of, of tentative definition of program is one way to look at what we were what we were aiming at in this building. And we ended up with very few parts in a sense for architecture to, to work with, some things that we're familiar with, uh, walls, in this case glass, columns, stairs, cores, uh, the kinds of, of almost basic parts that you see in something like Corbusier's Five Points. And we, we began to work with how these subzones of the building would collect and produce new relationships. So for example, this space, this space, and this space might aggregate into a, a single use opportunity, or they might be a space here, and then a space here, and then a space here, in different ways. This was sort of what we were modeling the, the project on. And to some extent, we were thinking of this not so much as architecture as having hard edges, but you can see ghosted into these plans, for example, uh, moments at which the definition of regions of space are slightly altered, more like the way 
a pencil or a stick when you put it into water sort of bends optically. So you could see this as a kind of programmatic refraction almost, a slightly altered version of program as you go from zone to zone to zone that would allow them to aggregate and distill into separate spaces uh, more freely and more, more tangibly in terms of at the same time their alchemies. <clears throat> this is what those plans look like. So uh, lower level, middle level, and then a roof level here, primarily outdoor the roof level. There's some interior space here and here. You can also see the way in which these slots orbit around. So for example, there's a slot here, and then that slot rotates here. Uh, there's a slot uh, here, and then that slot uh, rotates back the other way uh, on this side. So and they're anchored by the courtyards and pierced through. Exactly, it. anchored three. by holes. Yeah. I mean, obviously here we have daylight considerations and air considerations. So you, we have a fairly large floor plate here that necessarily uh, needs to be perforated to get air, lot, uh, air and, and daylight down into it. Here are some views that are basically in those slots as you orbit around, how, they, how you swing around plate to plate, and also a description of some of the, the sectional relationships that are occurring in various ways within the building from level to level. So you can see an affinity with the L house um, in, those, in those views and in that the creation of those possibilities through views. I think it's really important to come back to this universal space point because like the idea of shifting the notion of an axis in the L house, the idea of, of addressing universal space, it's not like this is a treatise on universal space or Mies, but it's saying what happens if you start to um, create possibilities in space as opposed to giving up a program altogether and saying anything can happen in this big volume, you start to provoke things and relationships happening with these different size spaces and these different uh, optical relationships. Um, as we move along, I want to keep us moving so we watch our time. But one point that I want to uh, add in addition to what Sarah just said or alongside it has to do with the way that we're approaching a kind of critique of the universal plan here, which is a friendly critique, mm -hmm, meaning mm -hmm. it's not so much that we're opposing the universal plan. Um, we both very much like, if not love, Mies. Um, we're so, not so much uh, trying to take apart that project, but we're trying to consume it or sort of dine on it in an effective way. The next project we're going to show is, is one that we'll go through relatively quickly, uh, but we wanted to give you a sense of how some of our thinking then moved into a much larger scale. And in particular, this is, this is a, a competition that was fairly uh, well known at the time, a number of architects did it. Um, but it, this is for a pop music center in Kaohsiung in Taiwan. In that bay, in, so they were, they were essentially filling in part of the bay this, for the program. This was an old shipping terminal and its, it's uh, use was changing uh, at the time and, and so they ran this competition. Um, what we were very, very interested in was the pe peculiar nature of music and collective life, meaning there is at once uh, a highly individual kind of act being played out with respect to music in a, in, a, in, a, in a program like this, and at the same time, a highly collective one. And these two uh, circumstances, we wanted to bring into a kind of resolution in one form or another. I'd say that that's something that we have that's true for every project, but this, this uh, music brought this um, idea to the fore. Yeah. We very quickly, which is something we tend to do in our work, we very quickly turned that sense of how individual life and collective life as social undertakings might exist, we very quickly turned that toward disciplinary concerns, meaning in this case, form and geometry. So uh, what, what we were interested in, in, the, in this case, the most individual form one could imagine is a circle, the kind of most determined, absolute, uh, absolutely singular kind of form uh, one could make. And we developed a, a set of techniques where we would say, okay, let's impose the circle on an organization, uh, crop out that organization, add that organization back in, but slightly altered, and then stitch that organization into what's adjacent to it. So now we still have a circle, a legible circle, but we also have ties that bring it back into the kind of super system of organization in some way. At the, at the scale of the city, 
basically what we're doing is trying to play this out to stitch back into the urban grid at this point, and at the same time produce highly defined kinds of spaces out in the landscape and a relationship to the waterfront. Yeah, the program consisted of very autonomous parts. So there was an auditorium, there was a museum, there were different parts. And so how do you take those very singular parts and then tie them back in? And so this, this idea, I think, uh, that is also consistent in our work is something where the relationship of parts is not a, a sharp juxtaposition, but is always trying to bring uh, parts in communication and conversation with one another. So here's a zoom in to a kind of plan view of uh, these particular kinds of drawings that we were developing in order to enable us to achieve these kinds of strong figures that would nonetheless be connected back to the city, strong figures stitched into a system, uh, strong figures uh, connected to one another. So we, we were developing um, ways of drawing, not so much as drawing, because I, uh, we both think that drawing is actually is, is carried out in support of architecture of buildings as opposed to for its own sake, uh, but drawings that would nonetheless allow us to sort of like iodine in an x-ray to see clearly the relationships that we were trying to produce. A bird's eye perspective of a similar zone of the project. This was also a project that we redrew, and, and I think partly like the intracenter, it's because it, we realized it was more important to us um, to, to continue working on the project and understanding how we worked at the urban scale. Yeah, you can take that in a couple of ways. One, we redrew it. Another, that we've got a little too much time on, that, on our hands, and the <laughs> other is that we're kind of boring people. All we do is sit around and draw this stuff. <laughs> But one of, one of the other things that came out of this was uh, uh, rethinking a little bit again how one combines a very self-referential plan system like a circle with other similarly self-referential plan models, uh, other circles. And this became quite interesting to us. So uh, compound relationships among circles or particular techniques, these little bites, for example, that would allow us to begin to relate to a context at the same time as we were, we were producing these internalized relations. It's very disciplinary, very focused on, so how do you make a plan out of a circle, which is not always obvious. And you can see all these different variations of high pieces versus you know, perimeter pieces and, and uh, or imposing a grid on it. So there's a, a sort of um, disciplinary exploration that coincides with our interest again in the, the individual person and the collective and the relationship of buildings to the city. Sarah has a PhD, so she says it like that. The one, another way to put it is we like buildings. <laughs> a couple of other zoom in plan views. The, this is our last project, right? Um, the final one that we're showing. Yes, this, yeah. this is the last project that we're going to show. Uh, and we, we hope to have a conversation with you in terms of the Q&A session. We'd love to hear your thoughts and questions, um, criticisms, if you have them, they're welcome. Um, and it's, it is a, another competition that we did for a stadium in Morocco. Morocco was at one point being considered as a, a site for the, the uh, World Cup, the soccer match. And they were, um, they developed a series of competitions for stadium sites. We actually did two of them, we'll only show one. Um, this one is in Oujda. Uh, Oujda is near the Algerian border in, in Morocco, a quite beautiful landscape, but as you'll see, uh, a quite particular landscape that was of interest to us, but very, very particular as a landscape, namely this. Um, so uh, this, is a, this is a landscape that is um, to, to, let's say an urban eye, empty. Of course, it's not empty. It's full of a, a particular kind of nature, but an extraordinarily interesting landscape that is, is um, quite uh, tricky when one thinks about putting a building into it. So we started with this and we became interested in the idea that we could gently imprint, so to speak, an infrastructure on this landscape that would uh, fill and then empty and be sort of ready for use or ready for occupation in various ways along the way. So keep in mind that a, a stadium is a, an isolated episode in terms of, uh, it holds isolated episodes in terms of use, meaning when there's a match, it's full and it's got 100,000 people in it. And when there's not a match, 
it's empty and its, its site is empty. And that is 95% of the time. So we were quite interested in this and the possibility that that landscape surrounding the, the stadium might become valuable. Here's what our site plan looks like. Um, this is the, the landscape that I was just referring to and the road to Ujda that way. This is a kind of primary highway that runs along, uh, along the front of the site and, and feeds into it. Uh, one of the things that is, is peculiar in this landscape is the, the, the nature of an object in that landscape. And we decided to be unabashed. We are not interested in, we're not, we're not at all interested in arguing against architectural objecthood, so to speak. Uh, what we do, we think often is make objects and we shouldn't be bashful about that in any way, shape or literally form. Uh, so in this case, we were interested in this kind of hovering uh, ring that most people coming down the highway on their way into Ujda would never stop and participate in. Uh, nonetheless, it would become a significant part of the landscape in its own right, unabashedly so. So what we developed to kind of zoom into a plan logic that you'll come, uh, we'll come back to in a moment. What we developed was a series of uh, uh, vignettes of access, so to speak. So modes in which one could come into the stadium going down below or climb up and go down below at the same time, down and up at the same time. So what you see here is vignettes of a ring around the stadium and a set of entry points, which is where our sort of figural game, so to speak, was played out. Not so much at the overall of the stadium and not uh, smaller than this, but in this kind of middle scale of access to the stadium, which looks like this then as a, as a whole. So all of those vignettes were these locations around the edge. So it's very deliberate to show this after showing the Kaohsiung, which was a very quick competition, but obviously played a role in trying to get us to understand how, you do, how do you take an isolated object and knit it into a context? I'm just gonna run through the, the plans now. Here's the lower level plan. Here's the section. You can see here how you climb up through those, those small, those mid-scale figures up onto a kind of uh, elevated deck. The playing field is down here below that. You can also go down from the, from the uh, natural grade outside to support services and another kind of access point to the lower range of seating inside the stadium. You should also maybe pay attention to this horizon that runs through, which is for us a kind of new horizon once one enters the stadium that looks like this. So here you're standing on that horizon, looking across at uh, what might be seen as the world's longest fenêtre en longueur, uh, to quote Corbusier. So the rest of this is going to be uh, somewhat longish. I apologize for that video. Uh, and we're gonna sort of pause our own speech while you listen. It seems like the sound is not going through. Oh. Okay, now it works. It's just, it's music. It's not uh, um, any language. 
Okay, and with that, we wanted to leave you and we would more than welcome any, any thoughts or comments, questions that you might have. Thanks guys. Um, that was really quite a treat, even though I didn't understand any of that French there. Um, I was just hoping since we didn't end the French, maybe you guys could have danced to the music or something. Um, Sarah, Sarah required <laughs> that I have a seatbelt on because I, I kept wanting to get up and jump around. Uh, it was really, it was really exciting to see all the new work. Um, and I wanted to, I wanted to maybe start by talking about this, um, this effort in redrawing the projects. Uh, also, because I do think when looking at the work, there's a very specific way you guys deal with drawing. Like even when there are images of a, of a digital model, of a 3D model, there's definitely a quality of drawing to it. Um, you know, like that intracenter elevation and plan that's kind of collapsed. There's almost a conscious uh, kind of flattening of, of something three-dimensional into a drawing. Um, I always felt it's almost forcing its way into into a plan. Um, so I, I'm just interested in, you know, your ideas about a drawing um, and this relationship of the kind of three dimensionality of the projects in relationship to drawing as a, as a means of working through the ideas of the project, but also um, redrawing. Um, you've mentioned, you know, the, the redrawing have allowed you to revisit some of these ideas and you know, I think about you know, certain architects, um, like ones that I think about is like the the Sixth Street house drawing that MD Zago did for um, Morphosis, you know, that really kind of actually changed the work that came after that set of drawings or even um, Peter Eisenman drawing Tarani's work. Um, mm -hmm. You know, how this exercising of redrawing, if maybe you can go into it a little bit more in terms of how that has, um, you know, what do you take from redrawing some of these projects? I'm sorry. I mean, I, there's a there's a slightly basic, and, and that's a I think a really very good question, especially for this audience, and and actually also for students, for our students. There's a there's one basic side, which is that um, work some of this work, like the interest center work was done a long time ago with fairly early computer skills and, and computer programs. And so partly it's a question of being able to redraw with tools that let you draw in a, a way, let you present something differently and frankly more beautifully. But aside from that, I think in terms of the more um, disciplinary yeah. response. You know, the interest center, the interest center is the best version of that because it started out, it has such a big gap between mm -hmm. its origin and when we redrew it, 20 years, let's say. And what is interesting about that was, of course, we, our thoughts had changed, our thoughts had evolved. I would like to think of it as evolved um, through that time. So not so necessarily opposed at all. Um, but what, what did happen was we developed a, a more edited version of what was important to us. And so in redrawing it, we were mm -hmm. able to abandon many things that were not important to us and strengthen those things that were. One of the things as we redrew it, by the way, was we didn't want to redesign the building. We deliberately said we have to keep it in its kind of base integrity as it was, although there are adjustments all over the place. We also, you know, it was our building. We could do whatever we want with it. It was, wasn't like we were beholden to somebody else's principles. But, uh, but we were very strict about hanging on to it uh, 
but editing out anything, for example, certain parts of the material systems we thought were unimportant. We want to make the case about form and program and not material. Uh, certain extraneous formal circumstances that were sort of too, even though that project is quite complicated, if, if I think about what we're working on right now, we're working on things that are formally simpler still, <clears throat> but there were many things that were idiosyncratic in a way that weren't helpful in, in that project. So we edited those out. Um, but also, I think one of the things that we, we uh, are ever mindful of is a drawing is a means to a building. And so we really wanted the, the redrawn uh, work to get closer to building, not further from building, even though we'll, that building will not be built. We know that it ended in a very interesting kind of scandal, which is its own story at some point. Um, but uh, not, it didn't involve us. We're clean. We're good. <laughs> but but, uh, but it, it, it won't be built, but we, it didn't mean that we weren't targeting a building, so to speak. So it gave us a chance to get a little closer to building, actually, uh, in, that, in that model that you saw for the interest center. There's, a, there's another really important point, which is that we don't see drawings as rhetorical or like when you talk about the flattening, we're not interested in turning a building into an image but actually exploring some of the ideas through the drawing and the redrawing. So for example, with Kaohsiung, the original drawings had, um, had the round buildings, the circular buildings, very, uh, as very colorful and very distinct from the context. And partly what we were trying to do through the drawing is understand how we can actually, through the drawing, make the argument of even though these are very distinct geometry, they can be part of the context. And so using drawing to bring that out without it being a poster or um, an image, which we're very much against in terms of contemporary um, attention to uh, representation purely as an end in itself. Yeah, I, I actually that that really kind of jumped out to me when you, when you, you guys spoke about drawing as means of, to build it because when we, <clears throat> You know, when I think back to, you know, how the interest center was and then, you know, in terms of those drawings and um, there, you know, I think if somebody who doesn't know the work and just look at it quickly, you will see certain similarities to, you know, different people's projects on representation today. Um, but then, uh, you know, having worked with you guys, I know that that's definitely not the case, right? That it, it's not about the kind of rhetorical and it's not, the, the project is not about the kind of represent, the kind of drawing as a form of representation. Um, yeah. Uh, there are actually some, some questions um, that I want to also read out. So we, our audience don't feel um, left out with this. I'm gonna maybe start with, uh, Nelson Chen's question. He is the our founding president of um, AIA Hong Kong. Um, thank you, Sarah and Ron, for a highly thought-provoking, open, and inspiring presentation about the early seminal projects of your professional practice. Greatly appreciated. My questions for you both, who are well-renowned as academics. Number one, as professors of architecture and professional architects, how do the activities of teaching versus practice most profoundly influence each other? And two, do you view yourselves primarily as professors with a practice or practitioners who teach? And does that make any difference in the end? Thank you for that question, Nelson. And hello from the other side of the world. It's, it's great to hear from you. Um, I mean, I, I think that, that there's a certain there's a certain luxury, I would say, in being academics because we're constantly immersing ourselves in this spectrum of thinking about work uh, within our discipline and attached to the real world. And um, so what you saw in, in some of our projects that does that, so looking at the issue of universal space or looking at turning a, a fixed axis into a wobbly axis or what happens when you make a courtyard house with a circular courtyard. Um, I think that those are things that one can often do in a studio project or in a classroom discussion. And it seems very removed from reality and very sort of self-serving as an architectural question. But I think that what we wanted to show is those questions are still very central to us as practitioners. And it's very important to run that spectrum from those, those issues which we think are very much 
within our language as, as practitioners and academics and those who focus on architecture as a discipline to understanding relationships between people. And so this issue of the single person and the collective in music or in the stadium, that, that topic comes through again, or in the interaction in the intercenter, how you see different parts of the program. Those are, that spectrum remains really important to us. And I, I find that um, being in academia allows us to be sure that we're, uh, we have that range whether we consider ourselves practitioners or academics first, I don't know, we're just WW. What do you think? I mean, I'd, I'd give you, uh, I mean, I agree with the last part. Uh, there, there are do sort you not of- agree with the first part? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> not in public, dear. Um, but so, um, so I would give you a particular example and it dates from, a, from when you and I met Clover. Uh, and, and Florence also, and it, it dates from the, about maybe 20, 25 years ago, something like that. I was uh, being considered for a promotion at the GSD and um, I had to give a talk in Piper and it was very nerve wracking and I had to assemble work to do that. And it was incredibly important to me. So I was looking at our practice work, assembling work, one of which you saw to one project you saw today, which is the interest center, it was part of that talk. And it gave me a chance to sort of look back and consolidate thought. And around that time, I wouldn't pin this solely on that lecture, but let's say for the sake of the diagram to answer your question, I would say in the course of doing that lecture, I was forced to consolidate thinking such that what I began to teach looking onto our practice completely focused from that moment forward. So teaching was affected by that, by that mm -hmm. consolidation. Mm -hmm. Similarly, what I began to teach started to percolate backwards into practice from that moment forward. And in other words, they are, they're not the same thing, actually. To teach is not the same as to practice. However, the subjects that we're talking about and the things that are important are very similar in both. What we want our students to be able to wield as designers and what they, we want them to affect, how we want them to affect change in the world is taught in one way and it's practiced in another, but the end game for both is very similar, if you see what I mean. So uh, I don't think they're one and the same, but I do think that they have the luxury of what we do is the reverberation between the two. Exactly. It's so exciting. Um, Shi Chao has a question here. Um, it's also a two-part question. One is, aside from programs, I noticed that you have talked about projects of various scales, ranging from single family house to that of a stadium. Is scale a factor when you approach the design of these projects? If so, how does it affect your design decisions? And two, you have talked about both built projects as well as competitions. Could you share with us your views on the built-unbuilt relationship of your practices projects, especially at its early stage? So scale scale is a very interesting question. At, at its base, there's a very famous quote from Max Bill, the Swiss architect, which is from the spoon to the city. We're basically on board with that, except that we, we want to already go into the kind of recipe that's going to fill the spoon. Uh, so we want to go a little bit uh, further back than the spoon. And we, we are now and we're, and into program. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we want to go a little bit bigger than city into region. So for example, we're working on a master plan right now for 840 hectares. And uh, it is incredibly interesting to think about similar issues at that scale, very fruitful. What I would observe about scale is if, if you look at, for example, um, where figure resides in architecture and in the city, at a small scale in the L house, for example, it's sort of internal in the workings of the house, how a wall makes its way around a courtyard, for example, in the middle of the house. At a large scale, it tends to be around the perimeters of architecture as opposed to internally within architecture. And so there are different locations and scales of figure that have really different implications for buildings as a whole, for infrastructure, for example. And uh, I think it's quite interesting, but I would like to, and I would, you know, I would say to a student, for example, um, uh, you know, small is not any easier than big, for example, it's kind of cliche almost, you know, designing a chair, I think would be one of the hardest things imaginable. Um, I've always resisted it because it's so nightmarishly difficult to ponder. 
but uh, but it also very exciting to think about that. So uh, they're 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 all valuable scales. I wouldn't necessarily say we have a predilection for large or small. Yeah, I think it's very funny because people will often meet you and say, "Oh, you're architects. What you know? What kind of buildings do you do?" And I think one of the pleasures of our office is that we've done so many different kinds of projects at different scales, and you become you sort of dive into a world with each project. So we know nothing about soccer or football. And yet, you know, we suddenly became able to do um, uh, stadium building. And frankly, we know very little about pop music, um, despite that that last um, uh, but effort. We, we, can, we like to say things like Taylor Swift or, or Man You. <laughs> so we do that, we do that all the time. But and so I think that that's also one of the pleasures that's a little bit again like academia that you're constantly learning and becoming you know you dive into a topic and similarly you can do that as architects and I think you can have that flexibility of scale. Um, in terms of the built unbuilt I think that's something for for you to bring up first. So one one of the things that you might notice in the work is we we tend not to we don't we don't want to simply produce an image of something. So in the stadium projects, for example, even if we want that, that uh, part of architecture to be quieter, silent sometimes, we're thinking about structure. The stadium in Ujda, for example, has a three ring structural system in which the, the column syncopation in, in each of the rings is optimized for economic reasons as repetitive, but from ring to ring does not repeat. But that's a structural meeting economic concern on our end. We were also very interested in brick in mm -hmm. that, in that um, stadium, because of its availability in Morocco, a very traditional kind of uh, building material, but we wanted to give it a glaze that was silver. Um, and so we wanted to kind of shimmer in the, in the desert in a different way. Like a, uh, the way we always characterized it was like a, a giant wedding band because we're married. And so, um, but we-, we... Oh, I'm supposed to tell them that. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, so the, the idea that this eventually becomes particular, that there is an egress there, that there is a material, that there is a structure, that there is an envelope and an environmental system and an energy cost is extremely interesting to us regardless of competition or, or building in CDs and contract documents. And so uh, we, we sort of, we try to erase that difference. At the same time, there's, there's always a message in a competition which has to come forward. And if you don't get that, you know, the, the, the uh, proverbial winning third place is always best. You have to do that with a message. And we've, we've won third place in more competitions than I can, I can count. <laughs> but I think, I, I mean, in a funny way, a competition is like a thesis project. And I think it's very important that point that you underscore that these are not rhetorical entries. We believe in these as really uh, conceivable projects that could be built. Yeah, um, and that that's part of our thinking, even in the competition phase. If, Go ahead. if I were to add something, it would be a kind of critique of the moment, which is a moment that is preoccupied with image as opposed Today, to with building. Yeah. Yes, with the production of an image of architecture as opposed to mm -hmm. architecture, which I'm, I'm deliberate in using the word building. It will be built and it has a foundation and it's, it's made of stuff that costs money and, and has an effect on the environment. And um, I think that, that that's really key. So, you know, we can talk about that. That's its own, that's another lecture, uh, but it is a really, really big deal to us that we see what we're doing as teachers and architects as leading to building. So in a way, would you say that it's, it's fair to say, you know, when you're selecting the competitions to be a part of, it's not necessarily in terms of curating a body of work of various scales or, typologies or different program type that, um, I mean, does that, does that happen in the selection of the projects you guys will participate in? Or it's more, you know, this, this came up, this is something that we're interested in. Like you said, you, you guys are not into sports. So it is, I'm kind of surprised that you would take on a sports stadium. I think like so the whole man you think came out totally unconvincing, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think that the, um, <laughs> the, the issue with, uh, it, the, where you'll see some consistency are these are projects where we like engaging public components. And so, yes, we're not we're not into sports, but we are into public public projects um, in our world, and and a stadium plays that role. I mean, I think it 
as Ron said, what's curious about a stadium is that it's either totally on or totally off. And part that was one of the things that we were pushing at a little bit with the programming, but that's a, a longer description of that, of that competition entry. But I, I think that that's, so there's a certain consistency of, of projects that have a cultural value or a public value interests us the most probably. But even a house, um, the relationship of that house to the exterior city or the room to room, the, the relationship of the people in the house is part of what, what interests us. And so it's, it's partly also always creating these um, relational components of program isn't something that's abstract. It really is how we live in the world. Um, I'm going to bring up two questions that's related to drawings. Um, do you guys actually see the questions? Because some of them are not questions and like friends saying hi and telling you how great the projects are. So yeah, we can see the we can see the okay. chat questions. We don't see the Q&A. So we see the chat questions. Oh, I see. I see. OK, OK. Because um, there are some in Q&A no, and I'll try to. Now. OK. Um, oh, Renee. What so yeah, there are lots of there are lots of people saying hi. Somebody called Alexander Wong is saying hi. Um, nice. Nice. Uh, so there are some questions about uh, going back to drawing. Um, one question in the chat had to do with the technology. You know how um, you incorporate technology um, and your thoughts about that. And um, there's also a comment about that your drawings are very expressive and argumentative. So how do you believe this type of representation affects your built work? Hmm. I mean, I, th I think the idea that a drawing is didactic is quite interesting. In other words, it's didactic, not simply to the world, though maybe it sends a message to the world, but it's didactic in its return value to us. So mm -hmm. when we look at it, we see things, we see things in a drawing that we wouldn't see even in a building. That's what drawings do. And in fact, this goes back to certain disciplinary terms. Why a plan? Why a section? Why a wall section? Why a detail? Because specific kinds of information come from specific kinds of drawings or models, physical models, digital models. And we, we try to mine them for that. And so in that sense, you know, we're, we're kind of old school in a sense that think of the Ecole des Beaux-Arts and the use of plan and the use of section, for example, which were without the section and the plan, the Ecole des Beaux-Arts just disappears. It doesn't exist as a, as, a, as a moment in time. And I think it's an, a really, really interesting thing to see and somewhat problematic that now we live in an age of, of rhino twirling um, I'm always a bit nauseated looking at desks at screens with models turning around like this. I have to tell students, don't do that. Stop, stop. Uh, give me, give me a moment to look at this. And, and so, you know, but I, for maybe to put it into more productive terms, I prefer when a student will use named views to use the, the code in Rhino, use a named view so that we can see this particular moment and what you're after. That's far more interesting to me than sort of twirling around in space. So drawings come specifically loaded with, with mandates, a plan one thing, a section another, and we like to use that. I'll, I'll um, add to that to answer Winston's question in the Q&A, which mm. we can now see. Um, so we, we do prioritize the plan, and Ron mentioned that at one point in the, in the talk, and the reason for that is our interest in program, because the plan is actually where program resides. It's our it's our disciplinary tool for talking about program is essentially the plan. Um, and, and then we are interested in how looking at plan and looking at these spatial relationships can give you surprising results in section. And I deal. think that that's where in Kaiway, especially, but also the L house that, you know, that back port back front porch is something that we didn't necessarily anticipate, but grew out of our plan interest. And so, Yes, we, we prioritize the plan, we work with the plan, but that doesn't mean we um, our projects are restricted to the plan. That surprising quality that Sarah referred to is really, really interesting to me because on the one hand, we use drawings, we're, we're advocates of a kind of coherence in architecture. We're not, we're not interested in a kind of willy-nilly-ness um, at all, even though we basically came out of the 80s when willy-nilly was the rage. You just like saying willy-nilly. And, willy and so uh, we're, we're not at all interested in that. At the same time, so if a, if a drawing, a plan or a section is used to produce coherence, 
it's, uh, it's mm-hmm. maybe its greatest moments have to do with when something unexpected comes out of that and you don't, you don't realize it. For example, the, the section perspective that we showed for Ujda of the, the section perspective with the, that went through the horizon level and showed the roof mm-hmm. and the underground. There are some very interesting things that come out of a view like that where you're combining a slight perspective and a section to produce certain kinds of understandings of space and they well, invariably have surprises in them. And so we have tools today that allow us to combine, for example, plan and section, or even plan and perspective uh, at the same time. And this is new. This is quite exciting to me that simply by combining two representational types, we can end up with new understandings of things. And we couldn't do that really so well 50 years ago. Can we turn to Rick's question in the chat? Um, Hi, Rick Lamb. Really nice to hear from you again. Um, uh, He is from our our 1.0 days. So Rick asks if uh, he explains that the the um, experience at OMA gave us a, a strong interest in program, and that was also part of the moment, let's say, and part of our education. And Rick asks, what at what point did the fascination with figure begin, and did you, from the very start, intend for the figure to be a methodology to guide or curate our future body of work? We have a couple answers for that. One is a kind of uh, genealogy, you could say that we're, you know, if we have two um, figures who influenced us in our, in the field, one would be Rem and the other would be Peter Eisenman, um, who obviously is very interested in form and the relationship of form in, um, in uh, pushing architecture and sort of um, defining architecture through form. And so the fact that we worked for both of these um, towering figures in our field um, and in a way sort of absorbed them into our DNA is, is partly true. But I think part of it is simply the realization that we traffic in form, that we, we do um, construct things out of matter that creates lines, whether they're walls in a house, as Ron was saying earlier, or walls of a building, they, they create boundaries and, and divisions and definitions. And that's actually something that's super exciting about the way we live in the world. Um, and then finally, um, in addition to having worked for Peter, form is something that um, was, has been a, a topic of, of um, academic interest for me. As, as Clover pointed out, Clover and Florence were in my formalism seminar a billion years ago. So that's a topic that we've been looking at for a long time in different ways. Yeah, no, uh, the other thing, the other thing, there are a couple of other things. Um, one is we moved from the Netherlands back to the US and that was significant. Like what, what's the role of program in a context and form in a context? And uh, the American context has actually been, has been somewhat more elevated on the formal side of things than on the program side of things, say relative to the Netherlands. So we were conscious of this. But one of the other things that has become really interesting to us, I think in more recent years is what's architecture's relationship to a public? The public really doesn't see so readily notions of program, but the public sees viscerally clearly form. And uh, mm-hmm. we, we're not interested in, in letting the one replace the other. We're interested in using the one, the visceral mm-hmm. attachment of a public to architecture via form to beneficial programmatic outputs. And I don't think it's interesting to deny the way architecture is received by a public. I think it's, in fact, I think we should not mistake the public uh, in any way, shape or form as sort of missing architecture somehow. They get it but they get it through certain vehicles very explicitly. And those are, those are things that tend to, you know, there tends, there's a kind of simple argument, a bad one, I think, which is form superficial, program somehow deep or profound. And we don't want to see the world that way. We want to see them feeding off of each other to produce significance. Um, it, it kind of ties to one of the earlier questions in the chat that says, if you can choose again, what type of architecture you would like to design as your first project? Good, good architecture. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I have to say, I think the Inter Center was an extraordinary project for us to have very early on in our arsenal because it was at once public, very social, Part of, so going back to this point that this was designed for a part of Lexington that where the majority of the population lived below the poverty line. 
I think one thing that we found very, very interesting was in our public uh, meetings with the population that, the, um, that would be taking advantage of this project, they understood how to read this project. And there were a lot of people who would say, oh, you know, that population wants a traditional brick central, you know, formal building. And actually that's not true. And so it was a very early lesson in the generosity of a public audience and that one should never make assumptions about um, how the public reads architecture. And I think that that project was just uh, yeah. an amazing experience for us. Yeah, yeah. You know, I wonder if I could comment on two things in two different points by different people in the in the chat. One is uh, Rick Lamb. Uh, Rick, uh, good to see you. Great that you're here. Thank you for joining us. If I said anything that was not true about that lecture in Piper, please don't tell anybody else. Um, and the other, the other is um, Alexander's question about uh, pushing boundaries and expression. I think, and, and there's a there's a more than a hint of critique in there, which is interesting. I think that's that's compelling to think through. One of the things that we have also been aware of is the value of form as foreground versus the value of form as sort of background or the thing upon which um, other parts of architecture play out. And by that, I'm, I'm returning now to program, but program happens in relation to form. And so when form becomes super expressive, you kind of overwhelm the capacity for it to act as the table upon which something else is happening. And you know, obviously what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm echoing a very modern sensibility that architecture, architecture remains a kind of container for action for us. And to some extent an inflector or shaper of action, uh, certainly, but it is also a background as well as a foreground. And so this question of expression is a really interesting one. How much is too much? How much is too little? We're not benign, we're not neutral. We're not, we're not simply wrapping space in the universal terms that, the early part of the 20, 20th century wanted to see it wrapped in. Um, but we are nonetheless convinced that we, at times, are background. We are not foreground. And this has to do with expression. It's quite interesting. I think maybe for me, the, the gold standard for what I'm describing right now is something like Sharoon's Philharmonic, which is an unbelievably expressive building, especially on its interior. And nonetheless, uh, wide open in terms of its social life, so to speak. I, I think part of what Alexander's getting at is, is what you were responding to, but I think part of it also is um, uh, maybe asking for more perspectives from the point of view of someone experiencing the project. Um, uh, so mm -hmm. that they, um, a point of view of going through the project, which I think is a, a valid point. We did edit down to the, the presentation of each project, you know, and I think, I think maybe the L house is where you got the, the focus on that um, point of view and the, the views through the spaces. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. Um, Alexander, come to, come to Cambridge and I'll buy you a drink and we'll hash this out. <laughs> Um, hey Renee, Renee, I like I like your note. The plan is a four plan is a four letter word. It's a good one. Yeah, Renee goes even back well before our Harvard 1.0 days. Renee goes back to when we first met in Princeton um, when we were oh, students. Wow. So um, wow. Renee, it's always always good to um, hear your name and to uh, think of our days back in in Princeton a long time ago as students. So I want to jump in with a question about, you know, at the beginning, you guys said this is not a, like, not exhaustive presentation of the work that you guys have done. Um, but, you know, I, I was thinking about a lecture I heard Frank Gehry gave a long time ago, where um, for the first 15 minutes, he showed, you know, maybe 50, 60 slides of projects nobody has ever seen that he did really early on. And he said, you know, I have never shown anybody this. This were all done before I published any projects, you know, any work. And he said, I had to do all of this work before I had to, you know, before I did the project that, you know, you guys have all seen. Um, and throughout mm -hmm. his career now, you know, Frank Gehry has done maybe like a thousand projects um, compared to like Corbusier has done maybe more like 70 projects. Um, you know, wrote a lot of books and have a very different like batting average, but those are two quite different models. So, I mean, do you guys see yourself in terms of building the practice more like the Corbusier, you know, 
Because I think if we look at tonight's work, it does feel like that, you know, that each one in terms of, you know, the the effort, the the kind of time put into it, redrawing it, the thinking through it, even when the project is finished, you know, how they kind of tie back to each other, that there's a kind of larger project and the kind of deliberateness to each one. Um, or it is, there's actually a hundred projects that you haven't shown us that, you know, that you actually work out these ideas at many different scales in much more messy ways. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Like what we're not seeing yeah. tonight maybe? Yeah, I'll, so I'll give you a two part answer. The first part is an echo of the Corbusier model. Um, you know, Corbusier purportedly, uh, this is an anecdote, so I don't know if it's true, but let's say it's true for a moment. He had a piece of paper by the door in the office yeah. on Rue de Sevres and on this, piece of paper, people would call up the office or, or they would stop by and say, I'd like you to design a building for me. And he would just make a note, okay, design a city hall for someplace. And um, it would go on the sheet of paper. So they would work on a project, they'd finish a project and Corbusier would supposedly go over to this little piece of paper. He'd look at it and he'd, he'd turn to the office and say, hey, you guys, what do you wanna work on next? So one at a time was the model there. Basically that's pretty close at the same, and there are reasons for that. One is, you know, architecture is a little bit like enjoying a dinner. You should you should sit and enjoy the dinner, so to speak, as you're doing the building. We have absolutely no interest in doing a hundred projects if we can't enjoy them. So that's a big big deal. Um, the second part of the answer is there are many many things that we have done that don't get the daylight. They they they're hidden. They're intentionally hidden. Um, I'll give you an example. We did Helsinki, the Guggenheim, mm -hmm. and it was uh, it was kind of interesting for us. It was it was interesting to work through some ideas, but we thought it simply didn't project architecture in the way that we wanted to project architecture. And we said, nope, it's in a box. It's it's closed up, mm -hmm. and so it's not on our website. It hasn't been published. It won't go anywhere, and it 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 simply didn't make any kind of of progress uh, in, in, in its manifestation that we were worth, that we were interested in putting forward. And we try to head that off earlier. Uh, we, we, have, we, we have done some things uh, where we've, we've said, okay, should we, should we not? And we decide not to do them. Uh, but we, we uh, on occasion, will go all the way through a project and it won't, it won't see daylight because we don't, aren't satisfied with it. I think there's a broader question in your question, which is a really good one. Um, and that is sort of how does one really start or practice today? Um, especially in the US, it's very hard to get yeah. a, a practice off the ground. And so there is one approach, which is I'll take, I'll do anything that someone throws my way and, and out of all of those efforts, something will emerge. And that's that's one approach. I would say that's not that's not our approach. We we do um, like to be more deliberate. We do have an ongoing conversation about certain things in architecture that interest us and excite us. That's sort of what our dinner conversation ends up being a lot of. So um, well, we're revealing how boring we can be. Um, but <laughs> but I think that the the point there is that it it goes back to the point that Ron's making that we we do have a project. We do. We do try and look at things that come our way and say, okay, is this going to work in our project? And sometimes you can't predict, and sometimes you have to pull out of something when you're part way through. Um, but but really, it's a question of building onto a, a project, a body of work, without also constraining too much. You know, sometimes we'll say, okay, we'll we'll try this and we'll see. And you you can only figure it out when you're part way into it. There, there are other times also where some work, I mentioned that we're doing a very large master plan right now, some work comes to us and it's almost unfathomable how one would take this on. Um, and this is one of those projects where how, how do you get your head around something which is, uh, yeah. you know, a thousand hectares? And uh, it, it is unbelievably um, daunting at a point. And as you settle into it, you have, there has to be something there which entices you into it. In other words, cities are worth thinking about is already kind of a simple but really good thing. Um, but how can we make a city better? This is a very interesting question. And as you settle into it, uh, 
the possibilities unfold and the techniques unfold, the ways in which one understands what that is unfolds. And there's, so it can't be, you can't imagine starting it always with knowing what the outcome is or the process right. is. You have to be open to the idea that this might be, this might be unknown and you might end up somewhere completely different from where you think you're going to end up. That's actually really exciting also. So I, I like that. You that's, know, that's hugely important yeah, that, yeah. That, that we don't mm -hmm. approach something with a concept that's sort of perfectly formed in our heads and suddenly you design a project that will follow that. I think that the way that architecture and, um, and writing and thinking all work uh, in sort of ricochet off of each other is really important. I think there's something very significant in the question, Clover, that has to do with, um, instinct for opportunity. Mm -hmm. And I think this is related also to modes of patronage today. In other words, how is the other world? I, I don't, I wouldn't put it solely on patronage, but patronage has changed today. Who is, who is asking us to do what in the world is changing. I think our relationship to that has honestly over the last quarter century or so faltered. Architecture has done a poor job of shaping its conversations in relation to a changing system of patronage. And I think we need to be proactive in that. And there are good patrons in the world and there are good architects in the world and we need to figure out how they talk to each other in, in a way that's beneficial. There's a little too much navel gazing on the architecture side and maybe a little too much preoccupation with what patronage might mean on the patron side. We need to, we need to go to dinner more often. You see what I mean? That there, there needs to be a better exchange there. I think this is incredibly interesting, but without a patron, Mm, not interesting. So when we're looking at something, part of what we're looking at is who's the patron here, whether it's a public patron, a private patron, a small patron, a large patron. Uh, the patronage question is a very big one. And we need to kind of step up uh, into that conversation. I actually have a question to that, you know, in, in regards to the dinner with the patron, um, but also um, to follow up Clover's previous question, I think it's really wonderful. Because um, I, I think we saw a lot of processes of um, internalizing in your presentation, a lot of editing, a lot of curating, a lot of redrawing of the work. Um, and also a lot of the ideas you presented was also very um, disciplinary. So also very internal to the discipline. And I wonder, yeah. you know, what forms or what formats will you take to communicate this idea to the, the patrons at the dinner table, you know? And also eventually it's also a question related to, you know, teaching, how will you, you know, teach student or prepare student with the knowledge and tools, you know, for them to deliver, you know, impact in the real world. Yeah. I mean, I think the interest center, going back to the interest center, and again, that was an audience that wasn't, let's say, um, a museum audience, right? It, it was, that was an audience that really was going to use the um, social services available in this building and um, an audience just of the, the neighborhood. And I think that that it's partly it maybe goes back to this idea of, uh, from Alexandra, sort of how do you show um, a point of view? I think it's it's partly um, talking people through what it means to to be in a project or how this project meets the city. Um, and so with that project, part of the idea with the parentheses, just to go back really quickly, is that. Um, there, there isn't one way of experiencing that building. It's not like you go and there's, there's one part of it that's more significant than the other parts of it. The library is more significant than the offices for social services. And so how do you make it um, something that is sort of has that neutrality or openness, but also is legible so someone can come in there and not feel lost or overwhelmed. And so partly the architecture is trying to show ways of entering spaces or making your way through a project. So part of it is a responsibility to show those images to um, any audience or talk that through. I think that's something that you can do verbally at the dinner table, or you can show through a presentation how one, you know, the different ways that one can experience a, a project. I, uh, I like your question, Chang, a lot. Um, I have a simple answer that I'll try to then articulate. Um, more ideas and fewer syllables is how I would go toward the public. <laughs> and, and so maybe to elaborate on that, um, more ideas means I think architects have become somewhat acquiescent when it comes to thinking that uh, we do anything in the world. In other words, we are, 
responding or reactive more than saying, I can offer something to the conversation through design. And I think we need to be more, frankly, assertive, less modest about that. At the same time, I think we need to be clear in, in allowing that to be accessible to our public. And we have to be listening to that public to say, what is it that you're operating with there that I can actually offer something to? So there's a kind of a handshake there. Mm -hmm. But I think, I think, frankly, we've become strangely acquiescent in the conversation. And I don't think that's healthy. I think we need to have, we need to bring our ideas to the table. We need to state them clearly, fewer syllables. And we then need to listen uh, better to what the world is telling us. We need to, you know, in one way, it's just read the newspaper, if you see what I mean. I want to um, piggyback Rick Lamb and, and Betty's question onto that because you're saying, you know, is, is the commitment to a particular methodology effective in um, building or branding a young practice or is it restrictive? And I think one of the things about the way we approach work is you can see a certain consistency, but it's not yeah, I mean, it, it, that consistency emerges from the way that we approach architecture generally. And so it's not a, um, a how-to manual, let's say, of, of how to, you know, it's, it's not that restrictive. Certain, obviously certain projects start to look like other projects, especially when they're done at similar times. So Kaiwei and the L House, I think have a certain, they're, they're working out a certain project of uh, what happens in a, in a square building. But I, I think that the, um, uh, the the point is that it's not you know it isn't that restrictive as a as a method. It's a method that emerged out of our approach to architecture. When I teach thesis, that's one of the things that I ask students to look at in their own work or in the work of others. Is if you can look across many projects, how do you start to see certain consistencies bubble up? And those aren't necessarily restrictive. Those are um, themes that you realize are part of your interests, obsessions, or approach. There's, there's an interesting question from Betty in the, in the chat, which has to do with diagrams. Yeah. Um, it sounds like Betty spent some time at OMA. So she, like many of us, uh, has been marinated in diagrams. And um, that's a good thing. Um, but I would return to something that happened to me as a graduate student, um, in addition to finding my girlfriend. Um, and that has to do with sitting in seminars and listening to uh, teachers in seminars say, never, never, never instrumentalize the diagram. Yeah. And I have spent the last 25 years trying to make sure I always, always, always instrumentalize the diagram. So... I am, I'm interested in, you know, everybody says, don't try to build the diagram. Uh, I don't think that's right. I think we'll, we build diagrams. We build really, really beautiful diagrams. They're made of stuff. They hold, they hold material, they hold environments, they hold buildings, systems, they hold economies, they hold social lives, um, but they are diagrams and that's what we do. We basically render legible our diagrammatic aspirations in beautiful terms. So I think it's a very good question. And I think the sort of perch of exclusion that the diagram has occupied, you either do the diagram or you do architecture somehow in a kind of formal or an aesthetic sense or, or life sense. Uh, I think that's a false perch, so to speak, Betty. Thanks. Um, are there, since we're almost hitting nine o'clock, um, and we can go till midnight your time. No, I was going to say it's it's never a good idea to talk about sitting down to dinner with these two because while they should do nothing about talking about sports or music, food is definitely one thing that if any time I'm invited to dinner with these two, I would go. Um, yeah, so talking about food with you guys is, is not a good idea. It always makes me hungry. <laughs> <laughs> Really um, good questions. Um, it's it's been a real pleasure you. to yeah. to have this opportunity yeah, yeah. to share our work and and have this conversation. And, wow, and I would, so I'd much. also I'd also like to say we're thinking about you all there in Hong Kong. We understand that some of the numbers are going a little crazy, and we've been thinking about you. So uh, uh, good wishes for all of it. Thank you. Thank you so yeah. much. Um, and thank you, Sarah and Wang. Um, is uh, 
I was trying to ask questions, but then it was like all these questions keep coming and you guys keep going, wow. Once you have a good speaker, you don't need to do anything. You just sit and enjoy. Um, so thank you so much for, for your time, Sarah and Ron. And, and I know I see that there's also a lot of like GSD alumni here that are joining today's event. So thank you all for your support. It felt like a reunion here. Um, Come back to the school. <laughs> I have to say that as a dean. Come back, visit. Come to Cambridge, please. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah, so we really don't want to let it end, but uh, I think it's already hitting 9, 9 p.m. and 9 a.m. your time. So thank you again. And if I may um, share one last uh, announcement for, for, for the audience here. Um, March 31st, we are going to have um, Edward Masria, uh, who is the 2021 AIA gold medalist, going to give us a, a seminar. Um, on, on maybe I can share my my uh, my uh, yeah. This is also going to be uh, a very good and important one for our chapter as well. So, um, Ed Masria is going to give a talk on um, how to keep the one point five degree alive. Um, it's guaranteed to be a very good talk, and I hope you guys can also come join us. Yeah. Okay. So thank you again. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, yeah. thanks really for hosting this. It's really, really kind of you. Good to see you all. Um, yeah. And thanks for the questions. Have a good evening. I hope you get some good food. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Bye now. Wow.